Okay, starting back with probabilities. First, we have the probabilities have to be between zero and one. And this is a rule for probability. Something that has a probability of zero would never, ever, ever, ever occur. And so I often say something like the probability that I get to meet Batman, not Christian Bale, not Ben Affleck, but actual Batman. That would have a probability of zero, unfortunate to say. Where a probability of one is something that always occurs. So probability one is, as they say, death and taxes, because those two things always happen. It's an, it's an old saying that there's always death and taxes. I guess that's about it. But a probability of one means it always, always, always happens every single time. So it's just the probability that an event will occur. When we look at the valid and invalid assignments of probabilities, we can't have negative probabilities. We can't have uh, probabilities over one. And let's go ahead and look at a table here and kind of compute some of our own probabilities. Now this is a very small table, but let's go ahead and see if we can figure out the probability of getting zero, one, or two heads when we flip a coin. So this right here is not that complicated of a problem, but we're just seeing how many heads we get when we flip a coin. What we can do is we can say, this uses a little bit more advanced topics, but if we wanna see zero heads, we need to get tails and tails. So let's multiply here the probability of getting tails and tails. And right here, for this one right here, we have 0 0.25. If we flip a coin twice, the probability we don't get any heads is 25%. Now using that same exact math right there, we would actually see that 0.5 times 0.5 again is of course 0.25. And what I found right here is the probability of getting two heads, of getting heads and getting heads. And you'll notice the last probability here has to be 0 0.50. And you can think about this to yourself for a moment because I could get heads and then tails or I could get tails and then heads. And if you've already watched this video one time, you've already seen the end where I talk about the words, meaning and, or, and what they mean with the rules. So come back to this if you want after you've seen the whole video and realize how I was able to solve this because I said, well, for getting one heads, I could get heads and then tails, or I could get tails and then heads. And if you can mathematically solve that right there, you're on the right track. And I was also able to solve this using the complement rule. But this is a valid probability distribution right here because it adds to one. None of the probabilities are outside of zero and one. So just recognizing this right here that this is what it has to be because if I didn't have one of these in here and this is all that you were given for uh, the amount of heads we could see, X represents the amount of heads. So zero heads, one heads, two heads, where probability of X is the probability of zero heads, one heads, or two heads. And the answer for this must be 50% um, if it's a valid probability table right here. And those are the rules for a valid probability table. The law of large numbers. Now this graphic you're seeing appear on the screen right now is the law of large numbers. And I want you to think about something for a moment. If we flip a coin 10 times and we get heads nine out of the 10 times, Think about what we would have expected on a fair coin. We would have expected five heads, and we got nine, which means we're four over. So we're four over what we expected, and we have 90% heads, that's way off. But now if we flip a coin 100 times, and we get 54, what did we expect? 50 heads. We're four over what we expected, but we have 54%. The coin never actually caught up, if you understand what I mean here, is it never started flipping more tails. It didn't make up that difference of four that we were off when we flipped 10. It just continued to flip at a 50-50 rate, which is its true percentage. So the law of large numbers means if you increase the trials, you'll go towards the true percentage. The coin didn't start to make up that difference. The law of averages say, oh, well, you'll start to average out. The coin's going to start to flip more tails to average it out. No, 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 no. Nothing averages out. It's about the percentages with the law of large numbers. When you increase the trials, especially in simulations, you will go towards the true proportion, the true amount, whatever is true, increasing the trials makes you go towards that. It's not like all of a sudden 
you start to get lower amounts or more tails because you're going too many heads. It's not like a slot machine that hasn't been paying out all of a sudden starts to pay out. Each time you're actually wrestling with the true probability every time you do a trial. And if you do enough trials, you'll see the true probability. This graphic on the screen you're seeing right here shows you the law of large numbers versus the law of averages. We will approach the true average with the law of large numbers. And that sounds weird, but when we do a whole bunch of trials, we will see the truth. The two words right here mean the exact same thing. Disjoint and mutually exclusive are the exact same thing. I like to think about two circles that are together, that they have a joint, that they are jointed. And that means that if A happens, B could also happen. It's like saying, oh, the Red Sox won tonight and the Celtics won. So those events are not disjoint. They could happen. The way to test to see if something is disjoint or mutually exclusive is to simply hold up one of your hands as a thumbs up and say, event A happened, the Boston Red Sox won tonight. Then you have to ask yourself, could event B happen? And if your answer is no, no way. And you could say, uh, there was a terrible thunderstorm all night throughout Boston with crazy lightning and there was flooding. Could the Boston Red Sox really play a game if there was a horrible, horrible thunderstorm all night with lightning and flooding throughout all of Boston? And the answer is no. Unless you said, uh, unless it didn't touch that area, but we'll pretend that the storm was completely over all of Boston and it was just crazy, flooding, torrential downpours, the game would be canceled. So in the, that instance, those events are disjoint. You can't have a tornado flooding and everything and have a baseball game. So those events would be disjoint. But in the other example, could the Boston Red Sox win and the Celtics win? Well, let's say they're both playing a game. Well, yeah. You say Boston Red Sox could win, yes. And then if you can say yes to the other one, then they're not disjoint. Well, the Celtics could win. Oh, those are two events are not disjoint. Once you say they can both happen, they have an overlap. And if you say one can happen and the other, no way that it can happen, no way. Like your grades in the stat class. Can you make an A in the stats class and an A in your English class? Well, yeah, you can. That can happen, so those are not disjoint events. Can you make an A in your stats class and a B in that same stats class? No, 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 those are disjoint events. You can only make one grade in a class. As soon as someone tells you they made an A in a class, you know they did not make a B. Now the way to test for independence is a little bit different. Independence means knowing event A tells you something about, about event B. And interestingly enough, if two events are disjoint, they are very dependent. Because making an A in Stat 201, would that tell you if you made a B? Yes, it would tell you if you made a B. So in that instance, that would not be independent. Making an A in Stat 201, you could say is dependent on making a B. Because if I say I made a B in Stat 201, you know I did not make an A. So disjoint events tell you if one or the other happened. Because if I say, oh, there was a crazy flood in Boston all night long, and it was like thunder everywhere, and you're like, oh, did the Red Sox win? Well, I've basically answered that because I told you there was no game by saying all of Boston was flooded out. It was crazy. Um, so you know the answer that is influencing. If you think about it, me telling you that there was a crazy flood and everything is then going to influence whether or not you know Boston played. So next we have something we've discussed we have know that disjoint events are never independent. So when we have a disjoint event, as we said, disjoint events are very dependent because if one happens, the other cannot happen. So just a general rule of thumb right there that disjoint events have to be dependent because if we know there was a flood in Boston and it's covered the whole state, flood in Boston, and there was thunderstorms everywhere, then we would know that there wasn't a Boston Red Sox game last night. So in this instant, you can't have major flooding and storms and everything, and then you can't have a game because if it flooded and storms and thunder and everything all crazy and disasters, there wouldn't be a game. So we know that the events are disjoint, and thus they are very dependent. Next, we get to the rules, and this is the big part right here. Understanding the addition rule and the necessary conditions for using this rule. Be able to apply this rule. So this table right here has the rules and the math and the word I use for it. 
So when we're talking about the addition rule right here, we are talking about adding things. And the word for this is or. So when we say, what is the probability you make an A or a B in statistics? These events would need to be disjoint. When events are disjoint, if A happens, B cannot happen. So you can't make an A and a B in statistics class. Because of this, we can add together the probability of making an A or a B in statistics class. There's no overlap. So this is the addition rule right here. And we use the word or, and the events must be disjoint. Review, if you want, what it means for events to be disjoint. So anytime you hear or, think addition, and then be like, okay, these events must be disjoint. Next, we have understand the multiplication rule and any necessary conditions for using this rule. The multiplication rule requires that the two events are independent of each other. And we've reviewed what this means, but that means one event does not tell you anything about the other event. So if I say, what's the probability I flip a coin that comes out heads and my parents call tonight? Well, maybe there's a 20% chance my parents call on any given night, and that coin is not going to influence whether or not my parents call. So whatever the coin comes up will be independent of my parents calling. So I can say, what's the probability the coin comes up heads and my parents call tonight? And that would be 50% times 20%. So we have there an application of the multiplication rule. Multiply two events together when they're independent. You can multiply two events together when they're independent. And the word for this would be and. What's the probability of this and this happening? So it means they both are occurring. So we could say, what is the probability of there being a tsunami? Or what's the probability of there being flooding and storms in Boston and Boston winning the game tonight? Unfortunately, this does not meet the independence rule. So we couldn't do it here. That would be a misapplication. So in this instance, we would say this is not the proper usage. We cannot figure out the probability of there being massive flooding, a uh, huge storm, and Boston winning their game tonight. And a lot of people might just say, well, the probability of both those would be zero because they're so dependent. And, but it doesn't really follow the rule of multiplying the two events' probabilities together to figure out the probability of both events happening. And this works right here when we have independent events, like what is the probability I make an A in statistics, and also it rains next week. I don't think it raining next week will really control what I make in statistics. You might say, well, you'll be more likely to study. No, don't go so crazy with it, unless you can figure out where it really kind of would change the other probability. So see if they are connected in some way, like what's the probability I go on vacation this summer and what's the probability uh, my car stays in working condition. So my car would probably have some control on whether or not I go on vacation. So you'd say, well, those two events have some sort of dependence and it's probably wrong to use the multiplication rule here because it doesn't meet our independence rule. Next, we need to understand the complement rule and be able to apply it. The complement rule is nice and easy because we can figure out the probability of something's complement by simply saying not that. If we say Boston wins tonight, the complement of Boston winning is Boston not winning. If we say it raining tonight, it rains tonight, the complement of it raining tonight would be it not raining tonight. And that doesn't mean it was clear out. It means something other than not raining. It could snow. We say it rains or not rains, it snowed, so snow is actually not rain. Um, it could be a hailstorm, I guess that might include rain, or it might not include rain. But anything we would classify as not rain would be not rain. So you can say you can make an A in stats class or not an A, which means you could make a B, C, D, F, or not get a grade in the course. So you either make an A or you do not make an A. So something in its complement is always everything. It's an important thing to note right here that anything plus its complement equals one. You're listing all the events. And we can do some of these probabilities of at least one. So let's take a look at this right here. So going back to our first table, we have here the probability of how many heads we will get when we flip a coin. And we're looking at zero, one, or two heads. So if we wanted to say the probability of getting at least one heads, the probability of at least one heads is 75% here. But we could do it by finding out the probability of getting no heads. The probability of getting no heads is 25%, and then not getting no heads. That sounds weird, but we did not get no heads. 
which means we got at least one heads. Let's listen to it for a second. We did not get no heads. So with this in mind right here, everything but getting no heads, which goes back down to the wording I used down here. When we subtract, we can use the word not or but. Um, I say oftentimes everything but, and everything is one. So everything but this event. And when we do that up here, we'd be saying everything but the probability of zero. So we can subtract, subtract this off right here and get 75%. So everything but the probability of zero is these two remaining probabilities, which is 75%. The probability of at least one is 75%. And I suggest doing some of these because um, it's often some of the hardest problems students feel on the test. If we were to say something like a family has 10 children, what's the probability there's at least one boy? And you could do that right now. You could figure out the probability that they're all boys. And so the probability that they're all boys would be 0.5 raised to the 10th. And right now, all we need to do is take 1 minus 0.5 raised to the 10th. So you can solve it yourself here. Uh, 0.5 raised to the 10th would be all boys. And then 1 minus that is everything but all boys. Try to think of it as a sentence when you write it out here. 1 is everything. Minus is but. And then 0 0.5 to the 10th is all boys. Everything but all boys. And it actually goes back to the multiplication rule because each child is considered an independent child when you have that child. You know, if you have a boy, it's not going to influence you, we would think, to have another boy. Um, with this in mind, the probability of having all boys is you have a boy and a boy and a boy and a boy. And you, the word you're listening to right there is the end because we're going to multiply 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 and such that it's to the 10th power. So you're actually doing the multiplication rule right there. So everything but having all boys, one minus 0.5 to the 10th. And that would solve right there because if you solve it, you'll find out the probability is basically, it's like 99.99% if you solve it because it'd be pretty crazy to have 10 children They they were all boys. It's very, very unlikely. So it's more likely you would have something other than all boys which is at least one boy. Now be careful because people like to say the complement of all boys is all girls. Remember, the complement of all boys is simply putting a not before it, not having all boys, which means there's some girls. Um, so with this in mind right here, make sure to think of this as we're just trying to write sentences. And these words down here have meaning. So let's go back and look at those words and or not but and they're associated with these actions now i have the disjoint rule for using minus because once again you'd want them to be disjoint and you can't have all boys and not all boys those are disjoint events so you can't have all boys and not all boys you can't say oh i had all boys but i, I did not have all boys that would not make sense so it goes by the same rules addition and trap subtraction are basically the same thing so they follow the same rule so lots of good stuff right here. If you have questions, feel free to email me. Good luck.